tonight, the reason you won't have scriptures on the screen is because I didn't get the notes to them in time, and that's on me, but I do have the notes on you version. So you can pull up you version tonight as we continue um, in our study on the fruit of Holy Spirit. The fruit of Holy Spirit. And as always, we want to begin reading Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Lord, open our hearts to receive your word. So that we may be, Lord, living epistles, Lord, before this world, and Lord, that we may walk, Father, in the instruction of your word to encourage and strengthen one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we've alluded to this, that Paul here in Galatians 5, in verses 19 through 23, that he is contrasting the works of the flesh Things that we can naturally do. We can naturally do what is wrong. We're born that way. If you wanted to say we're kind of wired that way because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. So nobody has to teach us how to do what's wrong. And we use the illustration of a child. I mean, nobody had to teach me as a little kid what to do what was wrong. It was my dad, you know, through discipline to teach me to do what is right. But when Paul is referring to the works of the flesh, he's referring to what we can naturally do, and he is contrasting here in these verses in chapter 5, the works of the flesh, which is plural, with the fruit of the Spirit, which is singular. The works of the flesh, again, are the natural outcome of a life that is lived out of sin and is not in a redeeming relationship with God through Christ. And what this clearly reveals to us is that the fruit of the Spirit does not spring from anything naturally that is within us. Yes, we do see in the world love. Yes, we do see joy. We see people talking about peace and working for peace. Individuals that may be more patient than us more kind, more gentle, more faithful gentleness, those who have good self-control. Yes, we see these nine, what we would say, works of grace, because they are in the world, but we understand that what Paul is referring to here in contrasting the works of the flesh, what we can do naturally, that that is within sinful nature versus the fruit of Holy Spirit, That in doing this, he is showing forth and clearly setting forth for us that these things are not a natural outspring of our life. They are things that flow from Holy Spirit, from a redeemed relationship. In fact, by Paul using the word fruit here, the word fruit refers to the, if you will, beneficial results The good things that come from the Spirit indwelling our lives. We're talking about the God kind of love. God kind of joy. God kind of peace. God kind of patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, the God kind of things, if you will. His character, there is no law. But it does not flow just naturally from us, from what? Paul is speaking to in verse 22 of Galatians 5. That Paul said it this way in Romans 7 and verse 18. He says, For I know that good does not dwell in me, that is, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So the fruit of Holy Spirit, Paul is clearly showing is the direct result of a new life that is given to an individual who places faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we begin to experience what Jesus was teaching teaching Nicodemus in John chapter 3, being born again. The fruit 
is only grown by the abiding presence and power of Holy Spirit within us. These truths that we know. The fruit of Holy Spirit is the outcome of a life that is lived in Holy Spirit. And the fruit of Holy Spirit, it identifies us as individuals who are disciples of Christ. Luke 6, verse 43, in the first part of verse 44, For there is no good tree, Jesus says, that bears bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree that bears good fruit. In verse 44, he says, For each true tree is known by its own fruit. And then he tells us in John 15, verses 5 and 8, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me, and I in them bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Again, alluding to the fact these are not natural attributes, these are attributes of Christ that are sown and produced out of our lives through the working of Holy Spirit as we yield and surrender to him. Apart from me, Jesus says, unless you are attached to me, you can do nothing of bearing fruit. And then notice what he says in verse 8 of John 15. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. The fruit of Holy Spirit proves that we are disciples of Christ. The fruit of Holy Spirit is not something that we can manufacture as We've stated in just kind of rehearsing this before we get to the fruit that we're going to talk about tonight, which is goodness. We don't manufacture what Paul is setting forth here in Galatians 5 and verse 22 and 23. This fruit is produced within our lives to the person of Holy Spirit as we yield to him. John 15 verse 5, apart from me you can do nothing. And we understand that through what Jesus says in John 15 and what Paul is speaking of here, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that is set in contrast to the works of the flesh, we understand we are not called nor are we able to produce our effort. Jesus says the effort that we bring to this, because there is effort that we bring as his disciples, as God's children, the effort that we bring is to be completely given to a body. And it's through our abiding and remaining vitally connected with him through prayer, through the study of God's word, through coming to an assembly or a small group, being attached to the body of Christ and different things. As we abide, then we're empowered to produce by Holy Spirit and therefore it brings glory to God and proves that we are his disciples. That's what Jesus said in John 15 verse 8. So these qualities, the fruit of Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, of the Christian walking by the power of Holy Spirit flow together from a heart that is indwelled by Holy Spirit. Paul is speaking of life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit, which is what Paul is referring to in contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Life in the Spirit means a life that is controlled by Holy Spirit. Because we have yielded our will to him. We can say no. We can say no. But we can also say yes. And it's by his grace that we can say yes and yield to Holy Spirit so that these things, these characteristics of our Father, of our Lord, are within our lives. In every area, our inmost attitudes and emotions to our outermost relationships and responsibilities. The fruit of the Spirit is to be reflected inwardly and outwardly. And again, as we noted before, the fruit of Holy Spirit is not spoken of in the plural as the works of the flesh are. And why that is significant is because it speaks of the oneness of the fruit. Therefore, every grace mentioned, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of these graces mentioned are a part of a whole. So that no disciple of Christ, no child of God is complete unless our lives are characterized by all. 
Not one person is supposed to be loving and the other is patient. We are all to be loving. We are all to be joyful. We are all to be peaceful because it is the fruit of Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Goodness. You know, as Holy Spirit works in our lives, our character changes. And where we had maybe harbored selfishness or, or cruelty or rebellion and, and, and possibly spite, things are, that would be categorized as works of the flesh, we now, in the Spirit, in Christ, as children of God, we now possess Love of a different kind, joy of a different kind, peace of a different kind, patience of a different kind, kindness of a different kind, goodness of a different kind. Everything in the list reflects the character of God. And goodness, as we come to tonight, to look at distinctly is one that relates directly to morality. In fact, the Greek word that is translated for us here by Paul in Galatians 5.22 is defined as uprightness of heart and life. Uprightness of heart and life. So when we look at the character of God, we find that God's character is portrayed to us, one of the bedrock characteristics of who God is is betrayed to us in Scripture as good. That we say it all the time, don't we? God is good, and all the time, God is what? And we know that. In everything, He is good. It is one of the bedrock characteristics of who He is that is revealed to us in Scripture. And what is amazing about God's character is He's not just good in general, He's good to us. Luke 6, verse 35. I got a lot of scripture tonight. Luke 6, 35 says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil people. He's good. The Lord is good. His goodness is praised in the Psalms. There are so many Psalms that that reflect and speak about the goodness of God. And I I just want to just rehearse a few before us tonight. Psalm 25 and verse 8, David writes, The Lord is good and upright. Those two characteristics are together. This goodness speaks of uprightness, righteousness within heart. The Lord is good and upright. Therefore, he instructs the sinner in the way. Psalm 34 and verse 8, we quote this many times, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. How blessed is the person who takes refuge in him. Or how about Psalms 86 and verse 5, for you, Lord, his covenant name, Yahweh, are good and ready to forgive, and we can all say amen to that, right? And abundant in mercy to all who call on you, because God is good. And he is good all the time. Psalm 100 and verse 5, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. And in fact, Peter picks up on what David writes in Psalm 34 and verse 8 about Taste and see that the Lord is good in writing to the church individuals who are facing persecution and possibly the coming months and years or even more extreme persecution. And he echoes what David says in Psalm 34 and verse 8. I'm going to start with verse 1 of 1 Peter 2 to just kind of get the whole context. But David, or I should say, Peter says this to the believers. So put away all malice. All deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, the works of the flesh. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Jesus affirms the Father's goodness when speaking to the rich young ruler. Mark records it this way. 
that the rich young ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Y'all remember that dialogue? But Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Speaking to God's character, and in that statement, we could equate it to almost an I am statement. In other words, what Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler is he was identifying himself as God. God is the one who is good alone. And what the Lord is speaking of here is absolute goodness. Absolute goodness, that there is no immorality within God's character. Absolute goodness is nothing more nor less than moral perfection, and God is morally perfect. And it is this kind of goodness that is reflected by God alone. Matthew 5 and verse 48, when Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, therefore, talking to those who desire to be people of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, therefore you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is what? Perfect. Goodness speaking to absolute perfection and moral character. And one of the grandest statements, I believe, in the Bible comes from Nahum. Maybe that's not a book that we often look at, one of the minor prophets. Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 7, listen to what the prophet says. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Let me read it one more time. The Lord is good. That's what the prophet declares. The Lord is good. And because he is good, he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. Here the prophet is speaking to God's goodness, to his character, to who he is. It is just because God is good that he is able to be a stronghold. Think about that. Because he is good, he is able to be a stronghold. And what this is referring to is that the moral government, if you will, of the universe, that that God has created, the moral government of the universe, of God's creation, is established upon a throne of righteousness. It is only faith in this sure fact, and that's what Naomi is saying here. It is faith in this fact that the that that God has created is established upon a throne of righteousness it's faith in this fact that can hold the soul steady in the storms of life because without such a basic faith in God's goodness and that that he has created is established through his throne of righteousness without such a basic faith all would be chaos it would be chaos And it's no wonder that the psalmist writes in Psalms 107 and verse 1, he declares this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies are everlasting. It's who God is. He is good. His goodness speaks of his uprightness, his absolute perfection in his moral character. And what he has created flows out of that throne of righteousness, his throne of righteousness. So when Paul says here, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, again, he is saying that our lives as God's people is to reflect this characteristic of our Father. Our lives are to reflect his goodness. It's to be a reflection and a conduit of his goodness. Again, you know, goodness is is speaking of an upright heart, It speaks of our ethics, our our morality. Goodness is virtue. The quality of being morally good, it is virtue and holiness, being separate or set apart in action. Goodness, goodness, the goodness of God within us is virtue and holiness in action. God's goodness is at work in our lives, and it results in a life that is characterized by deeds that are motivated by righteousness. Deeds that are motivated by righteousness and a desire to be a blessing. Because that's God's heart. 
And if it wasn't God's heart, John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 would never be a reality, would it? Even he says through the prophet Ezekiel, I find no pleasure in the wicked perishing. Because it is our Father's heart that the wicked turn from their wickedness and be redeemed. God finds no pleasure in that. Why? Because He is good. He is good. And this word good, when it is at work in our lives, it results in a life that is characterized by deeds that are motivated by righteousness his character, and a desire to be a blessing through that. It's a moral characteristic of a spirit-filled person. Goodness for the benefit of others. Goodness for the benefit of others. Not goodness simply for the sake of being virtuous, but goodness for the benefit of others. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 5, 16, your light must shine. He's talking about those that want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Again, goodness is a life that is characterized by deeds that are motivated by righteousness and a desire to bless from that righteousness. God's goodness within us manifests itself in the form of good works. What are we manifesting in our good works? His goodness. His goodness. How can I boast in that? I can't. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. And that's not an excuse for me to just go out and do anything I want to because I throw my hands up and I just say I'm not perfect. Absolutely not. I am to strive to abide so that God may continue to perfect his work in me that was begun by faith and continues by faith. God's goodness within us manifests itself to the form of good works. And our good works should manifest his goodness, his heart, his righteousness, who he is. His good works that he works through our lives by the presence and the power of Holy Spirit. And these good works are his righteousness that is at work within us. That's a privilege. That is such a privilege. And definitely it should humble us that his righteousness could be at work within my life, within your life as his child. And if his righteousness is at work within us, as a result, it will be at work through us. Through our actions and the things that we do. Matthew 12, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, You all spring of vipers. He's looking at the Pharisees. You all spring of vipers. How can you, being evil, express any good things? For the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. The good person brings out of his good treasures good things, and the evil person brings out of his treasures evil things. So in other words, for us as believers, for us as disciples of Christ, goodness has never been just a matter of outward behavior alone. It comes from within. And that was Jesus' whole point in the Sermon on the Mount to which the fullest degree is given to us in Matthew's gospel account in chapter 5, 6, and 7, that Jesus says the kingdom of God is a matter of the heart. It's not just those who say they're a Jew by the outward sign of circumcision. It's those who prove that they are children of God by the circumcision of their heart. God's goodness. Goodness. Goodness involves, we understand this word involves, that Paul is dealing with, it involves right behavior and the avoiding of what is evil. Living in this way testifies to whom we belong. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 2 verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds, God's goodness at work in us and through us before them, 
because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. How we live our lives. As Christians, our lives should stand out in a positive way from people that are within the world who do not follow Christ. We understand this. We know this from Scripture. Our aim is not to be different simply for the sake of being different or to isolate ourselves from the rest of society. Our aim in being vessels of God's goodness and being conduits of that goodness, His righteousness, our goal is to reflect Christ's character and shine His light in the spiritually dark places in this world. We are the light of the world. We are the salt. That's what He's created us through His Son and through the indwelling presence of His Spirit to be. Going back to what we had talked about, that, that goodness, it reflects just moral perfection. And God is the one who emulates that. And how that we are to be perfect because our Heavenly Father is perfect. And what Jesus is saying there is, we don't live by our standard. We don't live by anyone else's standard. No, we live by His standard. We look to Him. He's our standard of what goodness is. Not what the world says. What he says. What he says. And let's take that up a few verses to verse 38. Take it up 10 verses. And let's read the whole context here just with the understanding of this fruit, goodness. Jesus says this. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I say to you, Do not show opposition against an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other toward him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourself to be sons of your father who is in heaven. And again, that term sons is not a sexist term. It speaks of those who stand to inherit those who are co-heirs with Christ, that we would prove to the world that we are co-heirs with Christ. We are joint heirs with him of our Father in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Because even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brother and your sister, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? And here it is again, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Our standard is not what my flesh says I need to do or what my emotions tell me I need to do or what somebody else tells me I need to do or what our society tells me I need to do, our standard is the perfection of our Father. His goodness. What are we reflecting? Jesus here in these verses is not talking about letting wicked people get away with terrible behavior or refusing to apply proper justice toward those who are evil. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, verses 43 and 48 that we've just read through 48 help us clarify what Jesus is saying to us as his followers. And that is, he is referring to loving and showing kindness to those that the world would say or clarify or our flesh would say is our enemy because that's the natural thing to do. When we are wronged, we wrong. When we are hated, We hate. That's the natural thing to do. But what does Jesus say? If we are reflecting 
our God's character, this goodness that Paul speaks of in Galatians 5.22, which is the fruit of Holy Spirit, then when we're wronged, we don't react in hatred, but rather in a way that shows Christ-like character and values. Our actions toward those who are unkind to us, they should cause them, Jesus says, to consider what he is like. Do my actions cause people to consider what he is like? And we can look in many places in Scripture, and you know there are many virtues and many things that would impress us, right? Spiritual gifts. If we're honest, there's different giftings that people and the way that they are used and how God, the ministry that that God has given individuals that would impress, cause us to take notice and say, man. But the fruit of the Spirit is just as dynamic spiritually as the gifts. In fact, I would say more so. Because it reveals the character of who our God is. And is this character that is to be revealed in the gifts and govern and guide and direct the gifts. The fruit is the character of the gifts. And when we look through scripture, there's a couple of individuals that stand out, especially one. Maybe one that we don't think of often. Dorcas. Don't laugh. I knew when I said that name, somebody was going to chuckle. That's a real name, Acts 9. Y'all remember, y'all, y'all remember Dorcas? How about this, Tabitha? Is that better? <laughs> Tabitha. Tabitha in Acts 9 was no prophetess. She was no prophetess like the daughters of Philip or even Deborah, one of the judges. But the fact that she was always doing good and helping the poor has been recorded for the inspiration of believers all down through history. To the point she fell sick and died. And Lydia gets in contact with Peter. Says, Peter, you need to come. Hurry. And Peter comes. And what does he find? Widows. The outcasts, if you will, the, the poor. Maybe people that aren't acknowledged by the world. They're not important. But the Lord used Tabitha in her goodness and his character to care for these. That they were weeping and they were showing Peter all the things that Tabitha had made for them. That maybe this wasn't something that we would consider glamorous and glorious and would wow us. But it definitely wowed our Father. Barnabas, this particular fruit of the Spirit appeared in such prominence and richness within his life that it is recorded in Acts eleven twenty four. 24. He was a good man, full of Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Goodness, as we close tonight. Goodness. Speaks of an upright heart of uprightness and character that we are reflecting before the world who our Father is. Does my life reflect His goodness? Does our lives reflect His goodness? Father, Lord, tonight as we come to this part of the service, Lord, to reflect upon your word and to reflect upon this characteristic. Lord, we know that each one that we have looked at and the ones that are to come, all nine, that they are part of a whole. That we're not just supposed to be loving and then, you know what, I can work on faithfulness, but, but goodness, I, I just, I don't know. Lord, all nine of these are to be reflected in our lives, and our lives are to be conduits of them. 
Does my life reflect your goodness? Your goodness. Can we just take a moment right now and just ask him? Can we just just take this moment of reverence before him and just ask him? You ask him. I'm asking for myself. Does my life reflect your goodness, Lord? Lord.